Good morning, friends. It is uh, good to see you all today. Happy Friday, as we have said. And uh, it is my privilege uh, to introduce our speaker today, Chip Ingram. Serves as the CEO and teaching pastor of Living on the Edge. I'm going to summarize his rather lengthy bio. He's written a bunch of books. He speaks in a lot of places. He's married to Teresa. They have four grown children and 12 grandchildren, and they live in California. But Chip, what I want to say personally to you today is thank you for your faithful ministry of exalting the Lord Jesus, caring for pastors, loving the church, and staying deeply committed to the Word of God for so many years. And thanks for being my friend, because not a lot of people will put up with me. <laughs> Would you please join me today in welcoming Chip Ingram to Dallas Seminary? Thank you, my brother. Well, it is great to be with you all, and I've got a bunch of stuff up here. And it's always a, uh, an unwise move to try something new that you've never done before in a group that you're not familiar with day in and day out. But, you know, I love a challenge, so I'm going to go for it. Uh, we want to talk about how uh, to be relevant and teach expositionally in today's culture. Now, for those of you that are, you know, majoring in other things and you say, mine is not going to be a, you know, a teaching ministry, the concepts and the principles I want to talk about are just as applicable. In fact, um, thanks, to, thanks to my uh, bricklayer who discipled me with the Navigators, I still have multiple stacks of these little verses that I still memorize. And uh, Colossians 4, 4 through 6, topic, speak graciously. In order that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Listen to this. It applies to preaching, counseling, conversations, a Sunday school class, <laughs> and family during the holidays. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt, so that you may know how you should respond to each person. And uh, I was given a gift yesterday that's, that's pretty cool. It's a, it's a little kind of medallion thing. I'm not exactly sure. And on one side, it has all the core values. And on the front, it says, teach truth, love well. This is Dallas Seminary. Teach truth, love well. My concern, even among us Dallas Seminary graduates, that we're doing a lot of teaching about truth and not teaching truth. And to love well is not an ooey-gooey feeling that people like us and we like them and we get excited about how many people show up on the weekends. To love well is to lay down your life for others. It's people that are on mission, that are surrendered to God, that are progressively separate from the world's values, they understand who they are in Christ. They're living in radical community with one another, and they are giving good for evil to transform this wicked world that we live in. And the question is, how do you do that? I, I, have, a, I have a friend, uh, a, a fellow grad, and he would say, you cannot teach through books of the Bible in our day because the needs are so dynamic, uh, it just simply doesn't work. And so my uh, experiment that I'd like to share with you is uh, I just totally disagree. But I don't think we can do it the way we used to. Uh, there's a slide coming up. I'm going to tell you a quick story because what happened in my life wasn't because I got some big innovation. Um, I, I, my first eight years, I was a pastor in Kaufman, Texas. Pickup trucks, guns in the back, cattle, uh, a totally different world. Uh, young men walking around with a circle in the back of their pants that I couldn't figure out what it was, who seemed to drink Coke all day long. And I, I realized they were spitting. And uh, I graduated from here, and, and at the end of three years, I went out there, spent eight years. They taught me how to be a pastor. And because it's the Bible Belt and it's Dallas, I, I taught through books of the Bible. You know, we're going to go through the Gospel of John. In fact, it, you know, I would maybe tell a story, but hey, here's a, in, in the Dallas or in the Bible area, this week... We're going to be teaching in James. James chapter 1, please open your Bibles. And in many contexts, people nod and go, they're going to open their Bibles. So uh, eight years later, the Lord had us go to Santa Cruz. Think, uh, 
the most progressive city, first gay pride parade, um, more satanic bookstores than Boulder, Colorado, uh, people on the streets in hippie clothes who thinks the 60s never stopped, uh, alternative lifestyles. When people would come to church, they'd never heard of Noah, Adam and Eve, in our new members class, are you ready for this? It was like, okay, there's, there's a big part and a little part, and we're gonna start with the little part. It's a big book. And the big numbers are called chapters, and the little numbers are called verses. They knew nothing. That was a big disadvantage and a great advantage because they didn't have a lot of baggage. And when they heard God's word coming out of their pain and their addictions and their struggles, it's a big, heavy drug culture as well. And so I, I learned what I learned. So I got up and, you know, you get a, I'm new. And so what do you do? You, you get the gospel. So I'm teaching through the book of Mark. You know, week one, and, and people are starting to show up. And the church had been through a lot of pain, and more and more people were showing up, and I don't understand it. And after about four or five weeks in the book of Mark, this dude comes up. He goes, hey, man, like, um, you know, you know, like I was in a hotel room and I was like shooting up and I had this dream and I opened the yellow pages and there was a church said something about Christian. I showed up here five weeks ago and I received this Jesus, but is Mark ever going to show up or not? You keep talking about him. <laughs> True story. And a light came on and I realized I had a dilemma. I'm absolutely committed to teaching through the text and I am not meeting these people even remotely where they are. So how do you do that? And so uh, I, I'm going to, this is, if, if you came for an exposition of God's word, come to the next chapel. Someone will do a really good job at that. <laughs> or, or go to Dallas Seminary. But you can learn to do all that. And, you, and if you don't connect with people, you don't communicate. So how do you do both? And so uh, being very, very stuck, here, here was my solution. Um, I would study the text in context. In other words, I wanted to know, and this is old hat for you Dallas people and all you pastors and others out there, right? I'm going to study, say, the book of James, Philippians, Ephesians, and I'm going to study the entire book. I'm going to step back. I'm going to know the entire context. I will chart the entire book so I know where all the breaks are. I'll know the main message of the book, and I'll know in the first century, or depending on an Old Testament, this is the message to that group in that historical situation so that if I was one of those people in that day, and whether it's the Apostle Paul or Peter, whoever, I would understand he was saying this to me then, and it's clear, and it comes from the text. It's inductive. You're, you're all learning how to do that. And while well, I was doing that, but then I began to ask the question, um, I called it spiritual jeopardy. And the very first one I ever did, it's interesting, the art of survival we talked about, was James, a part of James chapter 1. So I decided I would teach through the book of James, but I would do it differently. The other thing was, is people were inviting their friends, and so I would make a little card, and you know James chapter 1, right? Consider it all joy, first four verses, right? Uh, if any man lacks wisdom, 5 through 8, ask of God. Uh, 9 through uh, 11, kind of this really interesting, you know, if, you have, if, you're, if you're wealthy, you have low spiritual status, and if you're poor, you have high because you'll be dependent. Blessed are you if you, what? You know, endure suffering, there's a reward. And so in the context, it's the first book in the New Testament written. In context, what Jewish, what believers are dispersed. Well, you, then you pause. Well, what, what was that like? Gosh, I, Jesus is my Messiah, and now I just got kicked out of my family. Well, the family system's there. If you get kicked out of your family, you're kind of out of the family business. And now if persecution starts, now I've got economic issues. I've got breaks in relationships. So my introduction, and the, here's the title of the series, How to Rebuild Your Broken World. And then it's, it's a four-part series. It's on a card. How to Rebuild Your Broken World. All the titles. Here's the cards. Invite all your friends. So they come, and the very introduction is... You know, have you been through a divorce and you tell a couple stories about, you know, you found yourself in an addiction, someone walked out on you, you had a friend who ripped you off in business, your world's fallen apart, you've gone through a bankruptcy. If Jesus would walk through that door right now and you could ask him, how can I rebuild my broken world? Do you know what he would say? Developmental question. Guess where people are now? They're not going, 
Okay, let's see. The history is about some Jews and a bunch of time. They're like this. And then the transition question is this. You don't have to guess. I'm going to tell you exactly what he would say because he shared it with his half-brother by the Holy Spirit. He would say to you, and then I teach verses 1 through 4. And then you want to summarize it in a way that they can take it with them. And so then the question became, the title of the message was, don't ask why, ask what. People who ask why get stuck in victimhood. People who ask what. What do you want to do in my life? What do you want to change in me? What, you get it? Well, then the next one is right, verses 5 through 8. What if, what if you're willing and you're saying, God, what do you want to do? And, well, then you have a question. Should I start a new business? Should I relocate? Uh, is it okay to remarry? Is, and you, There's a lot of questions that aren't in the Bible. And so the title of the next message is, what do you do when you're stuck? And so, again, you, you bring those kind of things up, and then what do you do? You say, here's a promise. If any man lacks wisdom, are you getting it? So you study the text. In fact, I, I laid it out in a, um, and I have this in a, in a larger fir- form, but here's what I wanted you to get. Study and chart the book as a whole. Break the book into the major sections with overarching message of the book in view. Then each section out of that book becomes a short series. And by the way, if you want to grow anything, people can't sustain things. I mean, I appreciate the great expositors of the past, you know, that so-and-so did this book of Ephesians. It took him two years. I I think he really enjoyed it. (laughs) And, And it may have been a different era. But the danger of going to Dallas Seminary is you know the language is better, you know theology better, and I'm not saying there's not other great seminaries. Don't get me wrong. Those of you out there listening from other schools, there's just a bias in me. And, uh, but what I am saying is the danger can be you go out and become little Bible school teachers instead of pastors. Uh, I, I teach at a place that brings speakers from all around the country on a regular basis, and there was a guy there who'd spent, you know, the last five years or so on spiritual formation. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of lining the people up who come here. This was a number of years ago. And he said, there's three kind of speakers that come. There's informational speakers, there's inspirational speakers, and there's transformational speakers. And by the way, and they're all really good. But there's some that come, and they'll start, and they'll teach the whole weekend. And I'll tell you what, you know what the book of Ephesians says. You might fall asleep now and then, but you know what the book of Ephesians says. And if you were ever in Ephesus a few thousand years ago, you are ready to roll. <laughs> and I'm exaggerating, but, you know, it's kind of like, you may understand here, but the Greek word for the <laughs> is the. <laughs> We can get enamored with our our knowledge and our skill. He said there's others that are um, inspirational. And he says they'll give us a passage, and then you'll hear 19 stories that are super exciting and motivational, and people leave filled with, that's wonderful. He said then there's transformational speakers, and they teach the text. They tell stories to illuminate the text. They move people to a point of actual decision that require them to take a baby step of obedience because according to Jesus in Mark 4, the most important parable of all the parables in Scripture because he told his disciples, if you don't understand this one, you can't understand the others. Ponder that one in your study. And then his pedagogy wasn't learn, 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 learn. He says if you respond to the truth of the light that you have, what? You get more. You don't respond, you, what you have gets taken away. And so as preachers and teachers and communicators and counselors, and when you're talking to people and you're across the table, the goal is not that they just agree or understand or get insight. The goal is that by faith, they see where they're at, what the truth says, and they take a baby step. Because if they respond to the light, they get more. And the goal is transformation. The goal is to become like Jesus. That is, that's God's game plan. The Holy Spirit is with you all the time when that's your goal. And so uh, I found myself doing that and developing it, and um, it created a pattern where I actually, for about the last 25 years, have been teaching through the Bible, but if you went to the website at Living on the Edge, you would say, wow, these are a lot of interesting topics. Um, 
I, uh, I actually, I never thought this would happen, but there's, um, I think there's some pictures. So let's, let's, let me give you this. Uh, op- open your Bibles to Ephesians real quickly. I want to get, give you a couple of examples so you kind of see what I'm saying. Okay. So, okay, walk with me. Like most people had to take either the theology course or I forget which Greek class. It was Ephesians and Philippians. So let's just chart the book together. Are you ready? We're right here. Ephesians chapters one through three, what? Who you are in Christ. Pivot, chapter four, therefore I urge you, walk in a manner, you know that word axis, walk in a manner where your behavior and beliefs tell the same story. The foundation, right? One through six, there's this unity we have. Seven through 10, what Jesus accomplished. 11 through 16, the role of the church, equippers to bring about maturity. Then the, the, the personal process of putting off and putting on 17 to 24, and then 25 through the end of chapter 4, is he gives five specific applications with our tongue, our attitudes, and our relationships. This is how you put this off. You renew your mind and you put this on. Chapter 5 opens up and talks about love versus lust. Then we get uh, the, the being filled with the Holy Spirit as the controlling factor in relationships. And then it's marriage, Right? 22 to 33 in chapter 5, and then it's children, slaves, spiritual warfare. Got it? Okay, so I'm going to teach through the book. And in our day, is there any book? So how, of all the ones, I I decided to bring the hardest one. Of all the books that was most challenging to figure out, what's the spiritual jeopardy? I mean, how do That was the answer, but what are the issues in our day that are parallel? And by the way, you can't cheat. No eisegesis allowed. You can't just get a a little idea about what it says and then come up with a lot of cute stories and flip it around and then tell that and get to the text. It's got to bubble up from the text. And so when you look at chapters 1, 2, and 3, and you study every paragraph, you have to ask yourself, What's the theme? Of course, it's who you are in Christ. And chapter two, we get this wonderful thing happening with this supernatural thing called the church. But how do you teach that in a relevant way? And so um, I brought actually my, um, my just, this is my sermon notes. And I'm going to give you, by the the way, there's a thing somewhere that says, uh, this is my experiment for your consideration. All right? This is not how everyone ought to preach or teach. I'm just living, if you live in an absolutely pagan culture like I did for that long, and you want to connect with them and teach the Bible, I just want you to consider how you unconsciously will do it may not resonate. And the temptation will be to be really, really relevant. And so I want to, I want to share a concept for you to consider, not that you necessarily ought to, because there's something deeper. Okay, this is the part in a message where Dr. Lawrence would say, Chip, you're off on a rabbit trail. Dr. Lawrence, I'm off on a rabbit trail, but I'm going to tell him. Here's my rabbit trail. I'm passionate about it. Why this matters and why I'm taking the risk to teach something that I've never shared like with a group like this ever before is this. The pandemic, okay, message will be over here. I'll be back after this station identification. Okay, right over here, rabbit trail. The pandemic was the great revealer. How mature is the church? Paradigm of the church, consciously or unconsciously, with great intent or falling into it. The church here and around the world, but especially here with our consumer mindset, was successful churches are measured by how many people show up on the weekends. Period. You don't meet pastors who say, let me tell you how many people I've got, you know, in my my discipleship teams and it's like, well, you know, how many are you running on the weekends? Well, we've got this many people, but this many people show up and blah, 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 blah. And whether, and so you take away the weekend service, and then we find out it's like ripping something off, and you look under the hood and say, how mature are God's people? Like maturity evidenced by novel things like the fruit of the Spirit. How loving are they? Joyful, peaceful, self-disciplined. How do they speak with one another? Where's their morality? And what we found in the pandemic, that the immaturity was like a bunch of Christian toddlers. If you open the church, I'm not going to come. If you don't open the church, I'm not going to come. If you make me wear a mask, I'm not going to come. If you don't have masks, I'm not going to (laughs) come. 
I don't talk to my kids now who are adult kids because I voted red and they voted blue. Uh, you believe in those vaccines? You need to watch Fox. It's a conspiracy. Those vaccines, you should watch CNN. It's a big farce. And we got vaccines and masks and opening and closing all underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ and the mission of the church. I don't think I've ever been so sad, and I don't think Jesus has been quite so disturbed in many thousands of years. With all the technology, all the truth, all the things that we have, when we couldn't do weekend services, what we realized is what we've done is we learned how to develop groups who would come to a weekend service. So if that's the goal, then what, what does preaching gravitate toward? Felt needs, hot, hot topics, and how to get people to come to the weekend. Now, by the way, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. Like a, a lot of what I understood when I, I would always lay out the year, have the first or six, nine months, all the series laid out. Uh, you have to look at, here's the growth season that you're always going to have in September. You have another big growth season right after January. You know where Easter's going to be. You know there's a family time that's going to happen during May. So, yes, you lay everything out. And there's got to be a balance of challenging and comforting, New Testament, Old Testament. But here's what you got to understand. If you don't teach through the Bible, you can get people to get to weekend services and not grow disciples. You have to teach with the goal in mind, and the goal in mind was never to get people to a weekend service. If you make disciples, here, here's my experience, you always have to set up chairs. Because when people's lives are different, guess what? They say, what happened to your marriage? Man, how... Man, this is a nutty world. Your kids are like different than my kids. Or, man, I was sucked into an addiction. And I've tried this and I've tried that. And we were in that group together or where I came from. I've been in the lifestyle 12 years. This is what happened to me when I was a little boy, a little girl. And I've been living with so-and-so. And I'm a lesbian or I'm gay or I'm trans. I mean, it's Santa Cruz. I'm a radical feminist. These were the people that were coming to the church. And they came by the thousands so how do you connect with them in a way where, yes, I want to come back, and my friends have to hear about how to rebuild their broken world? Or in this case, uh, I wasn't going to preach all the way through Ephesians until I could figure it out. So this is, uh, you know, the first six verses, right? Here's my little thing I will... Uh, each week as well, my goal was life change. So if it's life change, then I don't want to just give a message. I want to cast vision in the message. I want to put practical application in the message. And I want to give them something with a clear expectation that I expect them not only to put it into practice, but to help other people. So if you, uh, and all the notes I've ever done, they're free at living on the edge and just change a few things around, use them however you want, you know? So, seriously. It's better than some of the things you're downloading at Sermon Central. I have one of my staff members who has been with me a number of years and had family issues and had to relocate to Colorado, and so for a couple years, uh, he led all the Sermon Central. And he said, you know, um, my passion is for life change. And he goes, it just so broke my heart. He said, every Saturday thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of sermons are downloaded. And pastors all around America and some places in the world are getting their outline on Saturday night and preaching someone else's stuff and including a few of their perky little stories. No power, no application. He said, I just couldn't do it anymore. Now, is it wrong to learn from other people? Heck no. Are sermon outlines helpful? Yes. Can I tell you something? If I hadn't gone to Dallas Seminary, I wouldn't know how to chart a book, 301. And if I hadn't studied all those different books at Dallas Seminary, I would have, you know, Johnson made me do it, all those books and all those books. By the time I got out of here, I couldn't read a book without getting a big sheet of paper and getting to where I understood the book, the chapters, and the message. It's hard work. But what it does, it does something in you. See, the reason we have immature Christians is they listen to podcasts and they read a little something and they read listening to other people's pre-digested food doesn't build convictions. Amen. I've been a pastor for 40 years now. 
And I've seen bellwether people in our church who are elders and, and leaders and, and people who, when they find out their son or daughter comes home and says, I'm gay, their theology changes. Or I've been with couples who, I mean, they're, you know, life begins at birth and, you know, we're helping crisis pregnancy centers and their daughter's on a scholarship and she gets pregnant and they have her have an abortion so she doesn't lose her scholarship and then, in their words, ruin her life. Hey, you, you can say you believe all kind of stuff. It's when it's tested you find out what you actually believe. And so what I did on the front page was my introduction. It was the hook. The answer was the text. So what question? So, for example, this is Ephesians. So we know it's got all these heavy-duty things about being chosen that's pretty hard to teach and being adopted and all the rest. So, introduction, what comes to your mind when you think about ourselves is the second most important thing. And I give a little introduction. Our universal fear, rejection. Unhealthy responses to rejection. People pleasing, overly sensitive to criticism, withdrawal, driven to succeed, etc. Okay? Everyone deals with it. So I'm going to do a whole introduction. Guess what? What I know is everybody in the room struggles with rejection. And so I'll sort of lovingly and hopefully at times humorously, usually not on purpose according to my wife, <laughs> but uh, that I get them on board to realize we, it's we now. It's not some guy here or some person or teacher or counselor. This is where I'm at and I'm helping you. This is we, man. We're all in this together. Then, so what does God say about self-perception? And so I don't think you always have to do, so I go to Romans 12, Three, and talk about having a sober self-assessment. God wants you to have an accurate picture of yourself. Developmental question. Page one, open to page two, developmental question. How do you get God's view of you? So guess what? People don't bring their Bibles to church anymore. They've depended on screens. God bless screens. There's the text. And when I teach the text, are you ready for this? Did it for 10, 15, 20 years. I'm going to read that text, and then I'll say things like, why don't you underline this word, this word, this word, and this word? They're all the same. It's interesting, isn't it? Put a, please, Siri, not now. Put a box around the word therefore. Uh, here's, I want you to know, uh, circle this, 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 chosen, wanted. Those are really interesting words. Guess what I'm teaching them? I'm teaching them how to study the Bible. We don't want people coming and saying, that was a wonderful message, and you're a great counselor or a great teacher. I, if, if some of that happens, God bless you. What you want is people, eyes to open, and you transfer whatever leverage and authority or influence you have from you to the text, from the text to the Lord. And you know what? If you keep doing that for a while, I've had people come with the most bizarre doctrine in the world, and after about three years, their doctrine changes. Not because we got them in the corner and with the light and said, okay, we don't believe that around here. You're going to fess up, buddy. <laughs> It's when people go, guess what? They don't know it. They're, they're going to understand. So we study the text. When we get to that part of the text, then guess what? What does God say about those who are in Christ? Because that's what we learned. Two great truths. We are chosen. And then write in their notes, unearned, not based on what you do or what you don't do. It's eternal before you existed. The core truth, you're wanted by God. And then you... You give an illustration, and rather than trying to defend or figure out how election and all that stuff happens, and there's a place and a time for all of that, you tell a story about all of us as kids have been out on a schoolyard, and we're going to break up for dodgeball, right? And you're the captain, and you're the captain. They get chosen, they get chosen, they get chosen, they get chosen. Have you ever been the kid that doesn't get chosen? You ever not been not chosen for the job? Have you ever really loved someone and they told you they don't love you anymore and not chosen? Can I tell you something? If you're in Christ, you are wanted. You are wanted. And all of a sudden now, election isn't something that we're going to argue about. We're going to tell them from the foundations of the earth, God loved you, cares for you, chose you. And then you explain what that means. And not only that, but in this text, you're adopted complete with all rights, privileges, and blessings. And then you help them understand the difference between adoption today and a Roman adoption and how it was a choice and all the context. It's irrevocable. Core truth, you are accepted by God and are his child. 
And then you borrow from great people. I think J.I. Packard has the absolute best information on adoption anywhere in knowing God. And I took a few little things that would say what adoption means and gave people a passage for further study. And then in the very end, the back page is always application. How do you see yourself as God sees? How do you come to where that change happens? Because see, that's what we're after. Here's the principle. Replace your warped mirrors and misbeliefs with the truth of God. And this is where, in the great words of uh, Howard Hendricks, if you want people to bleed, you got to hemorrhage. And so you tell a story of my workaholism and my alcoholic father and my wife's warped view of herself until she sat across from Bill Lawrence and she was told, you're a mantle of God's grace. You tell them about what you've been through. You tell them about that man who abandoned you. You tell them how God brought Chip into your life and got to adopt those little boys. You tell them how you've been rejected by church after church and Christians because despite as an unbeliever and abandoned by an unbeliever, you've been viewed as a second-class citizen and sitting with her and the counseling we went through and the little cards that we made. I thought they were for her. (laughs) And you write down the lie. And then you put a stop sign on the card and you flip it over. And then you write the truth and then you put the passage. And for two years, we sat on the couch before I left and we reviewed those cards. And I watched a woman who was beautiful and smart and lovely who looked in the mirror and thought she was absolutely unlovable. And I watched her bloom and I watched her change. And I tell that story. And I say to these people, out of addictions and lifestyles and hurts and rejection, there's hope. There's someone that never changes. And he wants you, and he chose you. And then we talk about what adoption really looks like. And guess what? Now, I got an assignment. I put it in there. I want you to cut those out. I want you to use those cards. I'll see you next week. And by the way, at the end of each time, there's questions. Because I want dads who have a hard time with this, all all you got to do is a couple nights around the table. And by the way, quit sticking your kids somewhere else in these little clicky classes. By the way, I'm not against Sunday school. But what we've done is we've put our junior high and our high school kids in their own little groups where the social impact was far more than the biblical, and they have nothing to discuss with their parents. Here's what you do. Those things are really important. They're just not the first things. Third grade and on, they sit with you in the service. And then they go to their class, and you serve. (laughs) It's It's a novel idea. You mean I go to church, and I learn, and then I go help with the kids, or I go usher, or I get out there on the parking lot? Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> See, Christians are other-centered. They consider other people more important than themselves. Amen. I perhaps have gone a bit too far, but probably not. <laughs> so let me tell you, uh, you know, I, yeah, Mark said I've written a few books, and I have. But here's what I want to, here's what you've got to get. One of the things about the books I've written, they have a really long tail life. People don't market anything anymore. I mean, the publishers don't. There's not bookstores hardly. But, but what I learned is if it's, if it's hot, it's relevant, and it helps people for today, three years later, it may not. You know what this is? Uh, Discover Your True Self is uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. And so here, here's what I know about every single person. And I think this is what God wanted to get for people. Table of Contents. Wanted, the live rejected, you are wanted. Valuable, the live insignificance, you are valuable, right? Isn't that what someone is redeemed is? The lie of fear, you're secure, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The lie of shame, you're competent. 15 through 21, God's prayer, you have that power. Uh, the lie of guilt, you're beautiful. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, where you were, he has a purpose for your life. And the lie of angst, you are called, you're going to make a difference. See, they feel like they're getting all this psychological help about their emotions. You understand the world changed. We don't have a, we don't speak in spiritual terms. The therapeutic model has replaced truth. It's infiltrated the truth, the church. What we have to do is take that model, start where people are, get them in the text. So here's the rest of the book of Ephesians. Uh, Chapter four is yes, you can really change. I mean, 12 steps. Everyone wants to change, right? How does it happen? That's what Ephesians 4 teaches. Uh, Next is uh, Ephesians 5, 1 through 14. Love, sex, and lasting relationships. 
Everyone wants it to work. Now, you add some things, and there's a chapter that does research to know if you're in love or infatuated. So I, I think we have to take, I always try and take either sociological or medical or other research that bolsters so people get, oh, it's not just your opinion. That God's truth is God's truth. The next uh, part of Ephesians is marriage that works, 5, 22 through 33. Next part of Ephesians is about parenting, effective parenting in an effective world. And the last part is the invisible war on spiritual warfare. All I did was stay at a church for 10 years and, and I caught through Ephesians. Now, I never dreamed, you know, they would become books. Uh, and that's certainly not the point. And I, and I hope after a couple days, you know, there's no, I'm as surprised at that as you. Here's my challenge. Teach truth. Don't teach about truth. Here's, here was my mantra and is my mantra as a pastor. Stop measuring how many people come. I don't care whether it's your Sunday school, your church. Stop measuring or being concerned about how many people come and start being overly concerned about what kind of people are leaving. And if you say, what kind of, what kind of fathers are leaving? What kind of supervisors are leaving? What kind of employees are leaving? What kind of kids are leaving? Now your focus, your metric is going to be, we've got to have quality control. We've got to make people who are more and more like Jesus. So we have to have a safe place. And then there's lots of things that we would do. Preaching is the rudder of the church. Then you build your ministries around this kind of thing with an expectation that they're going to live out what you just taught them in Ephesians. Make sense? Um, I think I had a, uh, a conclusion somewhere that, you know, when you go off the notes as much as I do, you just never know. Um, here's what I'll tell you. I'm deeply disturbed about the world and the church. And we can tell people, and it's true, the church is the hope of the world. But the church as it's presently functioning, and I mean broadly, has gotten as consumeristic as the rest of the world. We've measured the wrong thing. By the way, someone at our church kept track of how many people came, right? Someone has to keep track. You have to have budgets, and you've got to figure out all that operational stuff. But what you have to do as leaders, as counselors, as people, you have to say, I have to be a man or woman of God who's a disciple. And if my life isn't about making disciples, I've asked pastors all over the world, do you believe in discipleship? Yes. Uh, is, that, is that important in your church? Absolutely yes. And then I just ask them, so who are you discipling? No, no, I want their names. I don't want your programs. If the senior leaders, if the elders don't disciple people, as the leadership goes, so goes the rest of the church. You get what you model. You get what you practice. Lord, my time's up. Would you please encourage my brothers and sisters? I'm not sure where this is going to land, but what I know is this. If we will creatively meet people where they're at with their felt needs and give them, flip it around, and give them the answers to those from the eternal God of truth, you transform lives. And transform lives, attract other people that are, regardless of what they say or think or post, it's just a bunch of needy human beings. And they're longing for hope. And you are our hope. Help us to transmit it powerfully in Christ's name. Amen.